You guys can go ahead and be seated. And let me just say Merry Christmas to all of you again. Welcome to worship. Those of you who are joining us online right now, I'm really glad that you are there. I know that a lot of you are probably here for the first time tonight. You may be in from out of town or something visiting with family or friends or maybe nearby and this is just your first time here. On behalf of our church family, welcome to our home. We're so glad to be here with you. My name is Steve. I'm the senior pastor here at UALC and it's a joy to celebrate the joy of Christmas with you. And I want to spend just a few minutes talking with you tonight about something that I noticed in this Christmas story that spoke to me or gripped me even much more strongly this year than I think I really had noticed before. It's the, something that the characters in the Christmas story experienced that I think we don't experience very much in life. And what I'm talking about is the experience of awe and, and wonder. And I see it, first of all, in the experience of the shepherds in the story. And it makes total sense. The shepherds are out doing what the shepherds do. They're out in their fields keeping watch over their flocks by night, as you may have heard before. And while they're doing what they normally do, suddenly they receive a visitation of a messenger from God in the sky with like light and glory saying, we bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be for everybody. And it's the announcement of a king. And I don't know if you noticed in the story what the reaction of the shepherds was, but if you ever heard, like I did at my age, the old Charlie Brown Christmas special in the translation of the King James Bible, they said, and the shepherds were sore afraid. When I was a kid, I used to wonder, like, why are they so sore? Did they work too hard? Did they run really fast? It was a thing. In the uh, more contemporary translation, like we read tonight, it says they were terrified. And of course they were. They were encountering something that was incalculable, power and beauty and majesty that was completely beyond their normal frame of reference. And then a little bit more reflective, although perhaps less dramatic way, I see it also in what the story tells us about Mary's reaction to all these things. In the second last verse of the story that we heard read just a minute ago, it's Luke 2 verse 19. It says, and Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. You think? I mean, like, what on earth have I experienced here? What is this? What does this mean? What, what am I supposed to make of all this? It is an experience of awe and wonder, shock, beauty, truth, inspiration. And if I were to ask you, what was the last thing you can remember in your life that you would describe as an experience of genuine awe, wonder, amazement, something that blew your mind with beauty or power that you hadn't really encountered before? Or how often perhaps that happens in life. I, I, I know that most of us would say it's probably been a while and it probably doesn't happen all that often. To some extent that's inevitable. At another level, we're not doing all that well for it, actually. We need it. We were made for it. As I described it, I bet there was at least a little bit of an appetite for it in you. A hunger for inspiration and beauty and awe. And it seems to me that there's kind of a parallel in a, in a similar way that our bodies are likely to starve and get weaker and get smaller if we lack food and water. I think when we lack awe and wonder and inspiration, so also our hearts and our souls shrink and shrivel a little bit. And we might even be tempted to go chasing after it, go seeking after it, perhaps in ways that are destructive for us. But I, I don't even mean to describe this really just in a like individual, personal sense, like we're just seeking indulgence or something like that. It really makes a difference in the lives that we live, in the community that we share with one another. It was almost a year ago, it was January or February of this year, I stumbled across a study. Some researchers did some work on the experience of awe. And I found this article in the Journal of Personality and Social Psychology, which I'm sure is on your nightstand too, right? You read that? Yeah, me neither, but I did happen to see this study. And the researchers in this study stimulated experiences of awe in people and then kind of measured their behaviors afterward. And what they found is that people who were experiencing awe became more generous, not only with their resources, but also with their time and their helpfulness toward others. People who experienced awe it showed higher levels of honesty and ethical decision making. They were less angry and they were less entitled. And I read a list like that, and I'm like, yeah, okay, I'm pro that. Like, I'll, I'll vote for more of that in life. 
And as part of the study, what they did to kind of uh, inspire awe, they did a few different things. For one thing, they took them out into a forest nearby and had them look up at giant ancient old trees, things that had been around for much, much longer than they had and were on a grand scale. By the way, they tried to do this also with looking up at giant buildings and it had none of the same effect, but the ancient giant trees, it did. And then they also sometimes showed them pictures from some of our best space telescopes and pictures of the vastness, the unimaginable vastness of our galaxy, which is really then but a tiny fraction of what we know, which is probably only a tiny fraction of the actual truth of the universe and just this amazing scale. And I'm reminded actually of an experience that I had almost 25 years ago now. I was standing on the shore of the Pacific Ocean with a good buddy of mine. I was living in Southern California for a year and he, more perceptive than I, <laughs> looked out at the water that we were both admiring and he said, I'm getting that small and insignificant feeling again. <laughs> Just this experience of awe, like, oh my goodness, this is not something I normally encounter, not something I normally imagine. And I think even about like the trends that we experience in, in our culture and society right now. And I, I think probably, I don't know how to measure this and maybe somebody has, but, it, but at least my impression is that we're kind of going the wrong way on most of those metrics that the study was demonstrating. It seems to me like we're probably getting less open to helping with one another, maybe less honest, maybe more angry, maybe more entitled. And, and I can't help but wonder if there isn't some correlation with maybe less and less encounter with divine majesty. Us more and more boxing God out of our lives and less awe would tend to lead to things like that. And a lot of times the first reaction of Christians, I think, would be to say, well, I know what to do about that. <laughs> I've, I've got an answer for that. I know a God that is majestic and huge and powerful. And, and what we need in our lives is probably to rehabilitate both our ideas and, and our ideas of and maybe our encounter with divine majesty and the greatness of God. And, and that seems to me probably to be partly right. And in some places in the Bible, in fact, God actually communicates to people about himself like this. Uh, my mind, when I was thinking about this, ran, first of all, to a passage that's pretty near the end of the book of Job. And I don't know if you know the book of Job in the Old Testament or not, but it's a story about a guy who experienced terrible things and was wrestling with, why did these bad things happen to me in my life? And there's a, in Job chapter 38, it's the, almost one of the last chapters in the book of Job, God communicates to Job and his friends and he's trying to get the idea across that maybe God has a perspective that they don't have. And what he says is, gives him this image, a couple metaphors for himself. He says, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth and stretched a measuring line across it? Where were you then? And then another image that I like so much, where were you when the morning stars sang and the angels shouted for joy? Where were you? And it's meant to just give Job and his companions a sense of just the, uh, the grandeur of God beyond the categories or dimensions of their imaginations. I, I think that's part of it. There was a, a book, in fact, that, uh, and I wonder if any of you, maybe if you remember some old Christian book titles, there was a book that was published about 40 years ago by a guy named J.B. Phillips. And the name of the book was Your God is Too Small. Your God is Too Small. And like I said, I think there's probably some truth to that. And maybe we've allowed our ideas of God to get small. We've diminished our expectations and imaginations of God. Although I think actually it's not so much that we would be guilty of this like in an intellectual way, defining God too small. I, I suspect as in as much as this is the problem, it's more of a practical, functional thing where we've kind of compartmentalized or I might even say departmentalized God. Where the Bible would present God as the Lord of heaven and earth, of every square inch of the cosmos and every moment of our lives. But we have functionally decided that we could demote God to the junior vice president for spiritual affairs. Right? Right? As long as we are thinking about that part of our lives, we could use a little boost. We need God to be our assistant. We'll call on God for that. But as far as the rest of my life goes, I think I got it from here and I'd prefer not to be micromanaged. Thank you very much. So, I, you know, I think there might be some truth to that. But I'm not satisfied with that answer. I, I don't really think that's an adequate solution or an adequate description of the problem or therefore an adequate solution, that too much smallness is the problem. And one of the reasons for that is practical, and I'll get back to that in just a second. But another reason that I don't think that's a good enough description of the problem, too much smallness, is because it's Christmas. And I'm trying to imagine telling God at Christmas 
that the problem is too much smallness. And God's sort of chuckling at me <laughs> and going, too much smallness, really? Feel like a dare. Here, hold my wine. I just made it from water. Watch this. <laughs> and then the second person of the Trinity became a baby, right? You guys ever seen a baby? <laughs> Held a baby? Hey, have you ever? Yeah, you did? Uh-huh, me too. I remember it very well, as a matter of fact. You remember the little baby's fingers? Have you ever looked at little baby's fingers? And I just find it hard to believe, it's hard to imagine that like even the bones and muscles and veins and arteries and capillaries and nervous system of an adult finger could fit inside that tiny little thing, let alone a whole human being, let alone divine majesty, (laughs) smallness and divine grandeur in one place. What an awesome miracle. And when the baby Jesus grew up, I think he showed us, he taught us and he demonstrated that this wasn't like a one-time parlor trick that God wanted to play, but this was a commitment of God. He revealed the character of God, the persistence of God's love for us and his mission to restore his world. When Jesus taught people about the reign of God on earth coming among us, one of his most common images for that teaching was a seed, small little thing you could drop or blow away in the wind, but containing almost unimaginable potential. And when he called people to follow him and built a movement, he called some of the smallest people, the humblest people, humiliated people, and made of them ambassadors of the kingdom of God to the ends of the earth. Jesus in his life experienced grief that feels so confining and small and vulnerable, and he shed real tears at the grave of his friend Lazarus, and then also called forth life out of death. And in Jesus' own trajectory, in his own crucifixion, Jesus died the death of the utterly defeated and then won a victory that could never be lost. Somehow in Jesus, God insists on becoming unimaginably small without ever ceasing to be inconceivably great. He somehow enters into mundane dailiness of our lives without ever ceasing to be eternal and infinite. He enters into the time of our lives without ever giving up on the timeline of eternity. What an awesome miracle. That inspires awe and tells me that the problem can't be only too much smallness. It's not only an incredible, awe-inspiring miracle. It's also really good news for us. (laughs) Because our lives are mostly pretty small. We spend most of our days doing things that have to be done again tomorrow. We spend our days answering emails, going to meetings, driving there so that we can drive back again later, fixing things that are going to break again later, fixing meals that have to be fixed again later in the very same day. Our lives are pretty humble and small. And were it not for the miracle of the incarnation of the presence of God and the person of Jesus Christ, there just wouldn't be any hope for us. We'd just be stuck in the meaningless smallness of our lives. But Jesus imbues the meaningless smallness of our lives with meaning and power and purpose and hope. Because not only is God there, which we might interpret in some sort of like hallmark coffee, God is in the small stuff kind of way, but much more specifically, God is there in the way of Jesus. God is there in the way of Jesus, giving us direction for the decisions of our lives and correction when we need it. God is there in those moments of our lives, giving us forgiveness for our many sins. God is there in those moments, giving us hope when all we see is dead-end despair. God is there in those moments, giving us healing when we experience unending pain. God is there in those moments, giving us community and belonging when we experience rejection and alienation. And God is there in those moments, in fact, giving to us faith when we would otherwise be lost in doubt. We come together at Christmas and sing, the king has come, hallelujah, but he didn't come somewhere else. He came for us. And so I want to invite you into a journey with Jesus in this new year. And and I'd like to remind you, hopefully it's good news to you, that Christmas is not, as we often experience it, just the end of something. Christmas isn't just the inevitable sad end of a sentimental season and now all you're left with is the hangover of wrapping paper and Christmas decorations that were a lot more fun to take out than they are to put away and credit card bills that were a lot more fun to build than they are to take care of now. 
Christmas is a birth story. And a birth is supposed to be a beginning. A beginning of life. And life together in a family, right? And this is the beginning of life together for us. A new journey, a new season perhaps for your life. Together with the family of God. And church family, this is what we're going to walk out again this year. In the Sundays of 2024, we're going to start opening our Bibles and we're going to be reading the story of Jesus' life. This year we'll read it in the Gospel of Mark. And each Sunday, getting a chance to come together to worship and pray, to encounter the presence, the awesome presence of God together, and to learn from the teaching and from the life of Jesus just how it is that the King comes among us, learning how to receive his direction and correction, his forgiveness, his hope, his healing, his welcome in all the moments of our lives that our hearts, our minds, and our imaginations would get reopened and reoriented and recalibrated week by week by week to walk with him, to experience his awesome wonder and his gracious power in all the moments of our lives. So I'll take a moment here and close this time of reflection on God's word and prayer praying for God's Holy Spirit to be at work in each of us and among us. So let's pray together. Almighty God, who has come among us, we come before you with humility and gratitude and actually wonder and awe at the depth and power and persistence of your love and your will to restore what has been broken. And God, we pray that you would do that in us. That you would come into the moments of our lives. That you would pour out your Holy Spirit in each of us. And you would pour out your Holy Spirit among us. To draw us to yourself. To lift our vision and lift our heads. To create awe and wonder and worship and faith and followership to you, Lord Jesus. We love you because you first loved us. And we pray in your name.